If you've already voted, then your job is to go help your friends and family make a plan to vote. Because this election requires every single one of us. And what we do this week will matter for decades to come. Now, I've sat in the Oval Office with both of the men who are running for president. And just in case you couldn't tell, they're very different people. I didn't think that Donald Trump would embrace my vision or my policies, but I did hope for the country's sake that he might show some interest in taking the job seriously. But he didn't. He hasn't shown any interest in doing the work or helping anybody but himself and his friends or treating the presidency as anything more than a reality show that can give him the attention that he craves, and he does crave attention. This week, it, with all, everything that's happening, you know what he brought up? He, he was fussing about the crowd size at the inauguration again, saying his was bigger. I, who, who, who is thinking about that right now? Nobody except him. But the rest of us have had to live with the consequences. More than 225,000 people in this country are dead. More than 100,000 small businesses have closed. Half a million jobs are gone in Florida alone. Think about that. And what, what's his closing argument? That people are too focused on COVID. He said this at one of his rallies. COVID, 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 he's complaining. He's jealous of COVID's media coverage. If he had been focused on COVID from the beginning, cases wouldn't be reaching new record highs across the country this week. If we were focused on COVID now, the White House wouldn't be having its second outbreak in a month. The White House, let me say this. I lived in the White House for a while. You know, it's a controlled environment. You can take some preventive measures in the White House to avoid getting sick, except this guy can't seem to do it. He's turned the White House into a hot zone. Some of the places he holds rallies have seen new spikes right after he leaves town. And over the weekend, his chief of staff said, and I'm quoting here, I'm not making this up, his chief of staff on a news program says, we're not going to control the pandemic. He just said this. Yes, he did. And yes, we noticed you're not going to control the pandemic. Listen, winter is coming. They're waving the white flag of surrender. Florida, we can't afford four more years of this. That's why we've got to send Joe Biden to the White House. because we cannot afford this kind of incompetence and disinterest. Twelve years ago, when I chose vice president, I didn't know Joe all that well. We served in the Senate together. I noticed, by the way, one of my great friends, Ben Nelson. Uh, Bill Nelson, see, I, I haven't seen Bill in a while, so that's why. Plus, he's wearing a mask, but you know, one, of, one of the great senators from, from Florida. And Joe, Joe and I served together with him. And, you know, I had a lot of friends in the Senate, but Joe and I wasn't the closest person. But he and I came from different places. We came from different generations. But I quickly came to admire Joe as a man who learned early to treat everybody he meets with dignity and respect. And Bill will testify to this. Joe's somebody who lives by the words his parents taught him. No one's better than you, Joe, but you're better than nobody. He believes everybody counts. He believes everybody's important. And that empathy, that decency, that belief in other people, that's who Joe is. And that's who he'll be. I can tell you, the presidency doesn't change who you are. It reveals who you are. And Joe, time and time again, has shown himself to be a man of principle and character, and he's going to be a great president. For eight years, 
Joe was the last one in the room whenever I faced a big decision. He made me a better president, and he's got the character and the experience to make us a better country. And he and Kamala are going to be in the fight, not for themselves, but for every single one of us. Listen, you've got a president right now, he wants full credit for an economy that he inherited. He wants zero blame for the pandemic he ignored. But you know what? The job doesn't work that way. You've got to be responsible 24-7. You've got to pay attention 24-7. Tweeting at the TV doesn't fix things. Watching TV all day doesn't fix things. Making stuff up doesn't fix things. You've got to have a plan if you want to make people's lives better. You've got to put in the work if you want to make people's lives better. And along with the experience to get things done, Joe Biden has concrete plans and he's got concrete policies that will turn our vision of a better, fairer, stronger country into a reality. Look, here's the truth. The pandemic would have been challenging for any president. But this idea that somehow this White House has done anything but completely screw this thing up is nonsense. South Korea had its first case of COVID at the same time, the same week as the United States. Do you know that their per capita death rate is just 1.3% of what ours is? Think about that statistic. I've, I've given this statistic a couple times and, and people haven't really focused on it. The number of people in Korea who have died of COVID per capita is one, less than one and a half percent what our death rate is. That's thousands and thousands of people if we had been as effective and responsible whose lives would have been saved in this country. Just across the border in Canada, the death rate per capita is 39 percent what ours here is in the United States. We are the largest, the, the wealthiest, most powerful country on earth, and we cannot somehow get a grip on this because our government hasn't been doing its job. Yes. 